Well, good morning, everybody. So, kids, you are to go to children's church. Do we have a children's church leader back there? Uh Uh-oh. Emergency, emergency, attention, children's church leader. All right, thank you, Sue. Woo! All right, so kids going to children's church. Follow that cheerful, effervescent lady, all in one nice group, off to children's church. Thank you, Sue. I mean, we used to just let them all go and just hope for the best, but then we realized, you know, we should really have them meet the leader and travel together in a group. That makes more sense. So a special welcome to anyone that might be visiting with us for the first time. If that's you, I'd appreciate it if you would find the guest card there in the pew somewhere around you. You can fill that out and drop it in the offering boxes in the back of the room there. And please grab a church mug from a table out in the lobby as our gift to you. It's got some info in it and some goodies and some treats there for you. Okay, well, just a reminder, I don't talk about everything up here every week. we got a lot of stuff going on, so please check the bulletin uh, for events and stuff like that. However, a few things I want to highlight. One is, it's kind of last minute in the grand scheme of things, but we do have a neat opportunity. We have a couple slots left open if you're interested to go on a mission trip. So in July, uh, I'm going, I'm taking my two oldest kids, and we're going with one of the missionaries our church supports, Dan Nelson. We're going to Peru. It's going to be uh, July 5th to 15th, something like that. We're going to be hiking up in the Andes Mountains, like 14,000 feet, um, camping, and going into villages in the evening and showing the Jesus film and doing stuff like this. So it's going to be awesome. We're going to have llamas, apparently, to carry our gear. So we got like two slots or something for this. So if you're like, you know what, that sounds awesome. We'd love for you to join us. Come talk to me and we can get some details uh, for that. But it's coming pretty quickly because it is July. Uh, two weeks from today. Two weeks from today, guys, we are switching our service times. So we are going down to one service on a Sunday and that will be at 930. So if you show up here at 11... I'm going to be in trouble, all right? So two weeks from today, show up here at 9.30. Our our Sunday morning uh, groups will be done for the summer. We'll take a break from that. And right after that service, in two weeks, we're going to have an all-church picnic outside in the field, hopefully in good weather. So bring some food uh, to enjoy with your family. If you have any sunshade to bring uh, to set up and help us out to help people that have a hard time with the sun, we'd appreciate that. Any lawn chairs would be appreciated. Additionally, uh, on that day, we are going to have a volleyball tournament. So if you like volleyball, start thinking about putting together a six-man team. Uh, Carla Johnson is going to run this for us. Is that Carla? Hi, Carla. There's Carla. She's putting this together for us. We also need two more volleyball nets because we want to have three up and running or maybe four. So if you have a volleyball net you could bring and set up, talk to me, talk to Carla, and we'll look forward to that being a good time two weeks from today. Okay, last but not least... I want to let you know, so we have a variety of changes in the works here, new initiatives and stuff for the church, which we're excited about. Uh, We announced these things at our annual meeting. The one I want to highlight this morning is we are shifting Matt Boyd's uh, position here at the church. He's the other pastor. For a number of years, his title has been Pastor of Discipleship and Equipping. Well, as we were praying over the direction we feel God wants us to go, we're like, you know what? We want to put more of an emphasis on children's ministry, uh, youth ministry, young adult ministry. And so we're shifting Matt's role. We're calling him now associate pastor, but he's going to have a special focus on running the youth group and the young adult group. So about half his time will be general pastoral ministry, 25% of his time uh, youth group, and 25% of his time uh, young adult group. And so they have a bunch of activities planned, for example, for the high school group this summer. So if you have a high schooler or one is in your orbit, you'll want to check that out. Uh, We had a lock-in here Friday night, 50-plus teenagers all night long. One in the morning, we were running around playing Nerf War, So some great momentum there, and uh, if you have high schoolers, we'll look forward to having you plug into that. And also the young adult group, cool stuff is going on there as well. Okay, that's enough of that. The rest of it, check out your bulletin. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit today about rituals. Rituals, traditions, ceremonies. So that, that term ritual, it sort of has a lot of negative connotation to us. Like, oh man, that's just a ritual. That's just a tradition. But if you think about it, something could be good that is a ritual or a tradition. A ritual or a tradition is something that is repeated, something that is 
practiced. And it could be that the reason this ritual or practice is repeated is because there's something that is of great value about it. So let's, um, let's stay, stay away from religious rituals for a moment, and let's talk about the rhythms and the rituals of our lives. So if you think about it, if you as an outside observer could come along and look at your life, you would probably be able to notice certain contours, certain rhythms, certain habits. Probably you do a lot of things kind of the same. You probably wake up the same way. You probably kind of go to bed the same. You kind of do certain things when you have breakfast. You do certain things on the weekends. You do certain things at work, on your free time. All right, there are general contours and rhythms and habits that we tend to fall into. And, and a lot of times, this is unreflexive and unconsciously. Well, let's think about these things a little bit. So as I was thinking about some of the rhythms and rituals of my years of growing up in the glorious days of the 80s and the 90s, some of the rhythms were Friday nights, my family, we would go out to Pizza Hut. And then we would try to make it home in time to watch The X-Files. That was the highlight of my week. 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old Greg. Um, Saturday mornings, I would wake up early because it was Saturday morning cartoons. If I got up too early, it was the test pattern. Does anyone remember the test pattern? Like, this was actually a thing, you know? G.I. Joe, Conan the Barbarian, man. Well, I'd finally get shut off by my parents mid-morning or when the dumb shows came on that were boring. Uh, in the summer, we lived in Pittsburgh. We'd take the boat out uh, on the weekend to go on the Ohio River on Saturdays. Or I'd follow my dad around the house and help with things. Sunday mornings, we'd go to church. Uh, growing up during the week, I remember I'd stumble downstairs, and pretty much the first thing I'd do every day, I'd find my mom. She'd be on the couch drinking coffee, and I'd snuggle up next to her, you know? So a lot of things that were not so reflexive, not like we thought through all of this, but these were the contours and the habits of my growing up years. Well, what about this? What if you made it your habit what if you had a practice of once a month in the winter, you get away from Grand Rapids and you would drive down to Duluth and spend all Saturday at the mall. And you'd walk around the mall. Now see, the tricky thing about rituals, habits, and practices, they have the ability to change us. They have an ability to touch and adjust what we desire and what we want, oftentimes in ways we're not aware of. So what if you had the habit or the practice of once a month going and spending Saturday at the mall? That's fun, right? You get to go around and look at things. But over time, is it possible that this practice or habit of just spending time in the mall and shopping there could change your thinking, your desires, and what you want? Well, what do you notice in the mall? Well, you notice all the mannequins on display. They've all got really awesome clothes, really fancy clothes. They rotate frequently. It's like, oh, here's the new thing. Here's the spring style 2020, mom jeans or something. I don't know. I thought that died in the 90s, but apparently it's back. Um, you look at all the people in advertisements displayed big. You know what? They all look happy. Why are they so happy? Well, clearly they're happy because they've got friends, and clearly they've got friends because spring style 2020. Look, they're wearing those jeans. I mean, though they aren't maybe, but I don't know. There's a dog in the lap. And so you can begin to be subtly affected by, well, I want that. I want that vision of the good life. I want to have friends, and the way to do that's got to be to dress like that. Or maybe we just, we just get this whole deal where, oh, I've got to make a good purchase. I'm going to bargain hunt. Look at that. I got that half off. That was awesome. I got that awesome jacket. That makes me feel good. That's great. And then, I will, then I'll look for the next thing, and then I'll feel good when I make another good purchase. So let's just be aware that even the innocuous, subtle, very neutral practices and habits in life have the ability to tweak our thinking and adjust what we desire. What if it was your habit or your practice, your ritual, your discipline to scroll through social media 30 minutes a day? Well, that's cool. You know, you check out the latest memes, you connect with some of your niche hobby groups or whatever. But is it possible that a regular practice of simply scrolling through social media could impact you as a ritual and adjust your desires and your thinking? Well, what do you notice on social media? Most people showcase all the happy, fun things, all their successes. 
Look at that beautiful Instagram filter on that picture. Man, look, everybody looks so happy. Nobody looks sad like me. Oh, look, that guy got a new boat. I can't afford that boat. And after a while, it's potentially possible that on one hand, we can be imprinted by this and start to feel like, well, my life stinks by comparison. Like, I don't have friends like that. I'm feeling very lonely. We can feel left out. Or what if, we like, what if the message we get, what if the vision of the good life that our practices are driving us towards is, is fame and attention all that? Well, I got to make a TikTok video. I got to, man, if someone viewed my TikTok video 100,000 times, then I'd feel really good about myself. And we can go down this path. So just we must be aware that, that the contours, the habits, the ritual of our lives actually shape our thinking and shape our desires in ways we don't fully always recognize. Well, the power of a ritual can be harbored for good as well. What if you made it a habit, a ritual every day of having dinner with your family? Like we force ourselves to sit down and we linger there and we have dinner together every day. Over the course of 5, 10, 15 years, what would that practice if regularly in place what might that do? Hmm? Uh, what if you made it your ritual, your practice to set aside, okay, there's one night a week. Uh, every week I'm going to devote time and go out on a date with my spouse. What might that do if it was a ritual that was practiced, a habit, a discipline that was practiced faithfully over time? What about the ritual or habit or practice? What if you set aside time every morning or every night for silence, solitude, contemplation, meditation on scripture, as you would engage in that habit, that rhythm, that, that rhythm, that ritual over time, how might that change your desires and the trajectory of your life? Well, God knows this about us, of course. He made us this way, and so he has given us rituals. And if you look in the Old Testament, when God gave his law and his commands to Israel to lock them in as his people, you'll notice he gave them a whole huge set of various rituals, ceremonies, practices, things they were supposed to eat, things they weren't supposed to eat, certain things they were supposed to do when they go to the temple. I think it was seven distinct feasts over the course of the year to engage them in whole-bodied ways in the worship of God. Sometimes they'd have to go places. Sometimes they'd have to sacrifice things certain ways. Sometimes they'd have to have the holy barbecue together. For tabernacles or booths, I understand, if I remember correctly, they would like make little tents and live out in the yard, for example. So rituals and ceremonies designed to imprint Israel with the love for God. Moving into the New Testament, we too are given rituals or ceremonies, chiefly two. One is the great ritual or ceremony of initiation into the faith. This is baptism. Okay, it's true you only do this once, theoretically, when you are baptized, when you become a Christian. But as you are part of the church and you see other people be baptized, this is a reminder to you of that. You are reliving it. You're like, oh yeah, I remember that. This is a tradition or a ritual that is imprinting itself on us. By the way, two weeks from today, we're going to have some baptisms. If you've never been baptized and would like to be, come talk to me. We'll make it happen. But the other great ritual or ceremony or tradition of the church is what we've been talking about all month here in May, which is the ceremony or ritual of the Lord's Supper. So notice here is the distinct key practice that Jesus command his peop, commanded his people to engage in, to repeat in order to remember him. And notice this isn't purely mental. In some way it's embodied. Like you take this bread, you feel it, it's got texture. You take the cup with the juice, you taste that. You enact this by taking it inside of you. And so here is a practice that we are to do regularly that has the power to be formative. God intends that the ritual, the ceremony of the Lord's Supper, does something to us and for us. This is a key component of our life together as a church and a key component of our sanctification, our discipleship, and our path of following Jesus. Now, as a practice... It is one that is to be engaged in regularly. And so today I'm going to lay out my argument for why communion, the Lord's Supper, should be practiced every week in the church. So we've already made this shift here at our church. We've gone to celebrating the Lord's Supper uh, every Sunday as part of our worship service instead of just once a month. Well, today I want to unpack the rationale for that. 
And we're going to look together and explain why I believe this is God's will for his church. And that what we're doing is stepping back closer uh, to what he intended. So as such, I hope you got a bulletin when you came in. I've got an insert in there. Don't be scared when it's this long as usual. We're not going to look at all of it. I've given you some more to look at on your own. But today we're going to talk through the rationale of why is this something we're doing every week? Why is this important? So if your friend asks you, yeah, why do you guys do communion every week? That seems a little redundant. You'd be like, no, actually, here's why. It's a good idea. Fair enough? Hey, by the way, those of you online, forgot to greet you. We're glad you're with us as well. Thanks for tuning in. (laughs) Okay, let's look here at uh, number one, part one here. And here's the most important reason for this, guys. Like, here's the biggest reason why this is something that we should be doing every week. The New Testament pattern was weekly communion. So this is what we see in the Bible. Now, nowhere in the New Testament or the Bible is it commanded, like, thou shalt observe communion every Sunday in church. It's not worded as a command. Nonetheless, we see this as the pattern. And as such, uh, we should take this as a guiding pattern. So let me show you the evidence for this. Uh, First of all, let's look here together at Acts 2, 42 to 47. Here's a key paragraph describing what life was like in the early church soon after it began. So look what Luke writes for us here, describing the church in these early days. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. Okay, there's the phrase we want to watch. And to the prayer, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Okay, look at the next key passage later on in Acts. This is a scenario when Paul goes to meet with a group of Christians. And it's sort of a spectacular, excuse me, spectacular occurrence here. So we often miss the more mundane point. Look what this says. On the first day of the week, which is what? Sunday. We came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. So, some of you fall asleep during my sermons. That's okay. It's biblical. See? When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Thankfully, the fall from the pew is not so bad. (laughs) So this guy falls asleep, falls out, and dies. See? So you should pay attention. Well, look. This is a miraculous resuscitation. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. So here's a a miraculous resuscitation of this boy. But for our purposes, notice the reference on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Now, this, this term to break bread, that doesn't necessarily mean communion because this terminology of breaking bread is just an ancient way also of talking about just sharing a meal together. So we see clearly that this can have this meaning. Oh, we just share a meal together. So for example, look at the screen. This is Luke 9, 16. This is from Jesus when he multiplies the loaves and feeds the crowd in the wilderness. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Typically done at the beginning of a Jewish meal, the host would break the bread and pass it out. So breaking bread together just meant having a meal together. However... When Luke says this in Acts 2, the early church gathered to break bread. Remember, if you will, Acts is part two. Acts is the sequel to the book of Luke. And in the book of Luke, Luke has used this terminology of breaking bread with specific reference to the Lord's Supper. So you remember Jesus on the night he was betrayed. Luke says for us in his gospel, as does the others, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them and said, this is my body. 
And look what Luke has said here in um, Luke 24. I think I put Luke 20 on your outline. That's wrong. It's supposed to be 24. This is after Jesus' resurrection. This is when Jesus is recognized by these two disciples he meets on the road to Emmaus. Look at the moment of revelation when they realize it was actually Jesus they were talking with this whole time. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. That seems deliberately reminiscent of Jesus' actions at the Last Supper, when he broke the bread, gave thanks, and gave it to them. So it's very likely that when Luke, in Acts chapter 2, is talking about the early church coming together to break bread, yes, it means sharing a meal together, but as part of that meal would have been the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Because in the early church, that was often done in the context of a fuller meal. So this is how most people would view this. So accordingly, notice, for example, the New Living Translation. So here's another Bible translation. Look how they translate this verse to convey this point. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. So that's their way of conveying this. Okay, additionally, look back at Acts 20, verse 7. Right? It said, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Why did Luke say that? Why the time reference? On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. What's the significance of the first day of the week? Well, that was Sunday, the special day of what? Jesus' resurrection, and we see because of that, the early Christians would have a special gathering on the first day of the week, on Sunday, for worship, marking Jesus' resurrection. So when Luke says, Paul came to them and gathered with them on the first day of the week to break bread, the implication seems to be this was the regular weekly worship service of the church. And notice how that service, that gathering is described with the purpose of breaking bread. Now, look, if you will, on the screen. This is the end of 1 Corinthians. We'll see some additional insight into this first day of the week language. So this is Paul writing to the Corinthian church. He's giving instructions here for the financial collection of money to send a big gift to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem who were dirt poor. So Paul arranged to have a collection taken among his Gentile churches to send back to Jerusalem to the Jewish Christians to help relieve their poverty. And look what Paul writes here. About the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Why does Paul say they're supposed to do this on the first day of the week? It's not rocket science, right? That's when the church gets together. So notice on the first day of the week is of special significance to the Christians. It was on Sunday, the first day of the week, when the Christians are coming together to worship. And so in Acts, we're told on the first day of the week, in Acts 20, they came together to break bread, which surely included the Lord's Supper by implication in Luke and Acts. Now, notice as well, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul clearly assumes that whenever the Corinthian church comes together, they are celebrating the Lord's Supper. So look at 1 Corinthians 11. It's on, your, it's on your outline here. He says, In the following directives I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. So notice he's describing all their meetings. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. Again, just notice he is describing all of their gatherings together, it seems. And look at verse um, 20. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. And he goes on to describe their particular dysfunction. But just notice how Paul assumes when the Corinthian church gets together, what are they doing? They're celebrating the Lord's Supper. Of course they did. Because Jesus had commanded them to do this in remembrance of him. And it was a center point of early Christian worship. Okay, so it looks like pretty clearly this is actually the pattern in the New Testament church. 
that immediately after Jesus' death and resurrection, as part of the corporate worship of the church, when they got together on the first day of the week, and frankly, probably more than that, whenever they would gather in worship, they probably, it appears, celebrated the Lord's Supper. So there's the first piece of the argument, and frankly, the most important. Like, if that's all we had, that would be enough. Like, okay, this is the practice of the first Christians. So by extension, uh, this is intended to be most likely what God wants for his whole church. But let's move on to number two. Okay, number two, the early church practiced weekly communion. So when we look at the evidence for the next generations of Christians after the New Testament, unsurprisingly, what we see is that the early church also practiced communion as part of their worship services every week. So look here on your outline. This is a verse from what's called the Didache. It's not in the Bible. This is our earliest Christian writing outside the Bible. Dated late first century, early second century. So it's very early. And look how this document introduces the discussion of communion. On the Lord's own day, which is what? Sunday. Gather together and break bread. And give thanks. Notice that Greek word for give thanks. Eucharist. There's that terminology in the Christian church calling communion the Eucharist, meaning to give thanks because we thank God in this. Having first confessed your sins so that your sacrifice may be pure. All right, I gave you a big reading here. You can look at it, the whole thing on your own time. This is written by a Christian named Justin Martyr. Look at the dates of his life, 110 to 165. Okay, so now we're in the second century. And Justin writes this. It's called an apology. It's written like to the Roman emperor. Justin is trying to get the Roman authorities to stop killing us, okay? So he's trying to persuade the powers that be, like, just leave us alone. We're okay. So look at his description of early church worship, early Christian worship. We'll just look at the last paragraph. And afterwards, continually, we remind each other of these things. And the wealthy among us help the needy. And we always keep together. And for all things wherewith we're supplied, we bless the maker of all through his son, Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Ghost. And on the day called Sunday, all those who live in cities or in the country gather together to one place. And the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. Then when the reader is ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. Then we all rise together and pray. And as we've said before, when our prayer is ended, bread and wine and water are brought. And the president, in like manner, offers prayers and thanksgiving according to his ability. And the people assent, saying amen. And there is a distribution to each. And a participation of that over which thanks has been given. And to those who are absent, a portion is sent by the deacons. So the deacons would take some of that bread and some of that wine to the sick or those who are at home. And they who are well to do and willing... Give what each thinks fits. Well, we can stop reading there. But you see the point? Okay, so in the second century, what's being explained in regular Christian worship is the reading of the apostles uh, or the prophets, a prayer, teaching, and celebration of the Lord's Supper. Look here at the next one, the apostolic tradition of Hippolytus of Rome. Here's another uh, writing we have. Notice the year. It's around the year 215. So now we're in the third century. On the first day of the week, the bishop, if possible, shall deliver the oblation, fancy word meaning what is offered to God, to all the people with his own hand, while the deacons break the bread. And it goes on to give some more instruction. But again, for our purposes, just notice the point. The assumption is, on Sunday when the church gathers, uh, we're celebrating communion. Because of course we are. Okay, look at these summary statements. Look at the second one. Even if this is a bit of an overstatement, it's still pretty good. For the next 1,500 years, there is no record of Sunday gatherings of Christians that did not include the celebration of the Lord's Supper. So this was the consistent practice for the entire church for 1,500 years. Okay, well, what went wrong? What changed? How did we end up where we are today when many evangelical churches, many Protestant churches don't even celebrate of the Lord's Supper every week. Well, it's an interesting story. So look here at part three then. Into the medieval period, communion continued to be celebrated at least weekly, though false teaching led to low participation. We'll explain what that means. So first of all, the church splits in about the year 1000, I think 1054. 
into the Eastern and Western churches. So the Eastern Orthodox churches in the East, they kept celebrating weekly communion as the climax of the service. In the West, the Western church, the Roman Catholic church, they also kept celebrating communion or the mass as part of the weekly service, except it started happening more, 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 even daily. So a few things in the Western church particularly led to a decline in Christians actually participating in the Lord's Supper. And three essentially false teachings, uh, we would say here. First, a requirement to confess your sins to a priest before communion. So this became established tradition, that before you could participate in the Lord's Supper, you had to go and in person have confession with a priest. That's a great idea to confess our sins. It's a great idea to confess our sins in the Lord's Supper. But this requirement began to lead to a decrease in participation. Second, understanding the Mass as a sacrifice that removes sin, performed by the priest, also reduced participation. So this view evolved in the Roman Catholic Church that the Mass was a sacrifice. It was a, a continuation of Jesus' sacrifice. So in a kind of a mechanical way, when the priest is engaged at the altar offering the Mass, this has the ability to forgive sins. And this eventually, essentially became disconnected from the actual reception of the body and blood of the people. So the third bullet point was the rise of what was called private masses. The understanding was because the mass is a sacrifice and forgives sin, you could arrange to have masses said for loved ones to get time off purgatory for them. So your beloved Aunt Bertha dies, and you know Bertha had some issues, so you're like, okay, she's in trouble, she's going to be in purgatory for a long time, but you're fantastically rich, so you, don you donate, let's say, $50,000 to the church. You're like, look, I want the priest to offer 100 masses for her to knock time off purgatory. And so it would come to be that the priest would end up at times alone in the church, the only one in the room offering mass for Aunt Bertha. And so participation of the people became less significant. So look at the summaries of what happened. This was already starting to go south by the 4th century. So we have a quote here at the end of that first paragraph. Chrysostom, at the end of the 4th century, complains that in vain do we stand before the altar. There's no one to partake. Already in the 4th century, the Christians were hesitating and stopping participating in the Lord's Supper. Look at the next paragraph. Although the number of masses was vastly increased, perhaps 50 a week in an average parish church, Reception of communion by lay people, meaning non-priests, dropped from approximately three times a year at the beginning of the Middle Ages to only once a year after the 13th century. So if you are a Christian in Europe after the 13th century, on average, you receive communion once a year. Even though mass is being offered in the church potentially 50 times a week. Okay, so things came to a head then in about the year 1500. The medieval church had gone so far off the rails that God raised up a couple people we call reformers who tried to bring changes in the church to return more to what was older Christian tradition, to return more to what the Bible taught. And so one of these was Martin Luther, for example. Martin Luther did not set out to start a new church. He wanted to reform the church, but he was kicked out. And so the Protestant Reformation began. Churches, groups of Christians broke away from the Roman Catholic Church. And so what happened? Well, Luther, of course, looked back over church history and recognized this was something we always did, communion every week. He saw the pattern in the New Testament. He valued that and wanted to continue it because the church should have communion every week. But he really had to work hard at trying to get Christians to actually participate in communion. So look at a quote from uh, Luther. Here's out of one of his letters. Look at his advice to a priest. Uh, I'm going to turn the page here. Oh, I, I forgot to give you your heading. I'm sorry. We're in part four. Sorry, guys. Let's do that first. Okay, we're leaving the medieval age now, if you will, entering the Reformation. So in the Reformation and up to our present day, practices of communion became mixed. So Luther and the reformers, they, the reformers, they tried to set it right, but things went sideways. So first of all, in this period, the Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church kept on going. Like weekly communion, absolutely, didn't flinch, which is good. So Luther maintained weekly communion and tried to get more people to do it. So look at his quote. He's giving instructions here to a priest, I think. First, that all masses without communicants should be completely abolished. 
So Luther said, look, no, no more private masses. The mass does not work to get people out of purgatory. There's no such thing as purgatory, okay? So we're going to completely eliminate the private masses, Luther says. Second, the one or two masses should be celebrated on Sundays or on the days of the saints in the two parish churches. Third, during the week, mass could be celebrated on whatever day there's need for it, if there's some communicants present who ask for it and desire it, and on and on and on. So in other words, Luther tried to, and it was hard because people were so used to not taking communion, they were scared to do it, and, and, and so he was really fighting to try to actually get Christians to come and participate in the Lord's Supper. Well, later on, the Lutheran churches, they kept this up for a while, but then this book suggested that they got infected by two ideas. One was called pietism, which was an emphasis on inward faith, and what matters is uh, your emotion, your love, your loyalty, and love for the Lord. And this was a reaction to sort of some dead coldness in the Lutheran and the Reformation churches. The Lutherans were killing the Catholics. The Catholics were killing the Lutherans. Everyone's being mean to each other. The pietists are like, guys, you got this all wrong. What matters is a sincere faith and love for the Lord. To that we'd say, duh, right? So that was good, but it had an an unexpected consequence that it, it moved people away from something that was more outward, like the Lord's Supper. The other thing that infected the Lutheran churches as the centuries rolled on is called rationalism. This is the Enlightenment. So all of a sudden, out of favor came anything to do with tradition or dogma, the supernatural largely rejected. Okay, so those two influences together came to reduce an emphasis on communion. So by the time the Lutheran immigrants arrived in North America, it was not uncommon to only periodically celebrate the Lord's Supper. Well, what about in other branches of the Reformation? Uh, Among the Reformed in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, John Calvin was the great reformer here. Look at the next paragraph. So he tried to maintain weekly communion, and he also tried to get more people to do it. Unfortunately for Calvin, the civil authorities forbade him to practice frequent communion, fearing that it represented too radical a change from the late medieval practice of infrequent reception of communion. So under the Roman Catholic Church, there almost nobody did communion. Calvin's like, we got to do it. We got to do it every week. We got to get everybody to do it. And the local government was like, no, 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 too extreme. Okay. And also there was a reaction against Roman Catholicism. And so some in this circle said, well, the Roman Catholics do communion every week, so we shouldn't. But you know, that's not, enough good, that's not a good enough reason to stop doing something, right? And so among the Reformed, they moved away from weekly communion. And then things got worse when everybody came to America. Because all of a sudden, we're in America. It's the pioneer days. We're on the frontier. We're cutting down trees and making log homes, and there's 50 miles between the next family, and that's how we like it. So, there was a shortage of clergy. And because people had a high regard for the Lord's Supper, Christians would meet together in little groups, but unless there was an ordained minister that rode through town that week, they wouldn't celebrate communion. So the norm became infrequent practice of communion. Things got worse again in what we call the Great Awakening, which on one hand was a wonderful revival that God led, but what happened in the Great Awakening was we shifted the forms of how we do worship services. What happened during the revival period is you would get a group together, you'd get a tent or something or get in a building, and there would be music, there would be a, a kind of a long, drawn-out teaching, And the goal would be conversion, getting people to repent, give their lives to the Lord. Well, that's good. And it was very effective. Uh, One of these guys was named Charles Finney, who was a wide-eyed radical in a lot of ways. But he was phenomenally effective at getting people to make decisions for Christ. And so he pioneered a variety of things. We have preparatory music. We're going to emphasize emotions. We're going to sing together. I'm going to give up, if he would get up and give a message and call you to repentance, and you would come forward in an altar call. Does that sound familiar? This is where we get our church service style from. It comes out of the revivalism of the American frontier. And so on that emphasis, which is driving towards conversion and coming forward in the altar call, what was abandoned and lost and neglected at some level was communion. And so what you'll notice then is, okay, The pattern in the New Testament church, communion, part of weekly worship service. The early church, consistent communion for 1,500 years, the climax of every worship service. Though the wheels went off bad. 
And even though there was regular communion, almost none of the actual Christians were actually participating. Luther and Calvin, the other reformers, they tried to fix it. They said, we need to maintain regular communion, but we actually need to get the people to engage in it regularly. But things went sideways and off the rails again, and really by a series of historical accidents, we arrived in the place when many of our churches don't celebrate communion every week. And so what many evangelical Christians are recognizing is that we threw the baby out with the bathwater. Like, and we've neglected this key practice that fairly clearly God intended for his church to engage in, which was weekly communion as the climax of the worship service. So, that's a lot of ground I know. Thank you for not falling asleep and falling out of any windows. (laughs) Bottom line, what do we do about this? Let's put it this way. Value the weekly celebration of communion. Value the weekly celebration of communion. That's all I'm really driving after today. Let's raise this in our estimation as something desirable uh, and important. Four suggestions, most of this by way of review. First, by recognizing weekly communion is the implied New Testament pattern. I mean, pretty clearly that is what we see in the New Testament. It's not commanded, but it's pretty clearly assumed. Second, by learning that weekly communion is the majority tradition of all churches over the centuries. And that should make us sit up and take notice. If here's a practice that has been nearly universal through all of church history, we should deviate from that only only very cautiously. Third, by realizing the arguments for weekly communion are far greater than arguments against it. So, if you have someone that's used to only doing communion once a month, and you say, we're going to go to communion, it's going to be every week, often the first thing concern someone will raise is, well, wait a minute. If we do that every week, it'll no longer be special or significant. What do you think about that? It could happen. Because there's some truth to that. Like, we don't go out to eat at the 17th Street Grill every day, right? I mean, if we had the ability, if we did go to the 17th Street Grill every day, we'd probably get tired of it after a while. Well, what if I gave you this advice? You know, it's a mistake to tell your wife you love her once a week. If you do it that often, it won't be special anymore. You should only tell your wife you love her once a month. Then it'll ring with more significance. What do you think? Yeah, Steve, like, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Or what about this? Look, I, I believe brushing my teeth is very special. And so I... I only do that once a year, but you know what? It is with great, great heartfelt significance that I brush my teeth once a year. We'd be like, huh? No, you're, that's a, a different type of thing. Like, no, yeah, it's special. That's good, but it's the kind of special you're supposed to do twice a day and floss, you know? So I, I think it's wrong-headed to say we shouldn't observe the Lord's Supper every week because it'll no longer be special. Now, admittedly, What we will need to do is focus and work at maintaining a celebration of the Lord's Supper as something significant and important. Because as good as ritual and tradition is, when it goes sour, it can become dead ritual and something we do without paying any attention to it. So admittedly, that is a danger. But same argument could be made for doing communion once a month versus once a year. That's not, a, that's not a defining one. What about this? Some people say, well, it takes up too much time in the worship service. If you do communion every week, well, that's true. It does take a, bit, a little bit of time. Um, so we aim for our worship services to be an hour and 15 minutes. So we're not adding anything here. What we're doing is trying to compress a few other things to make room for the celebration of the Lord's Supper in our worship services. And I think it's, it's, we can do that, and this is an important thing to take time for and to linger with because it is something commanded for us and it's a good opportunity for us to draw near to the Lord in an embodied way. Third thing, people say, well, if you celebrate the Lord's Supper every week, it's going to make unbelievers feel excluded because as I'm supposed to and I usually remember to, I will say, look, this is communion. It is for those who are Christians, people who are committed to Jesus. If you're not a believer yet, uh, we're glad you're here, but we ask you not to participate yet. And so some churches, for this reason, have a whole separate worship service away from their normal service where they do communion. 
But is that a good enough reason to not do communion? No, in fact, in that case, the person who's not yet a believer in Jesus needs to know they are excluded. They need to understand that participation in Christ is not automatic. And this coming to the table to renew the covenant, if you will, with the Lord through the Lord's Supper, this is for those who are believers in Jesus. The ceremony of entry into the faith is baptism. The ceremony of continuing in the faith is the Lord's Supper. And so it's important, I think, for the person who's not yet a believer to hear, okay, that is something reserved for when I choose to bend the knee to the Lord Christ and accept his grace. Fourth and finally, by leveraging weekly communion for your own spiritual growth. What we're going to want to do together is to look forward to this time and to do what we can every week to leverage this ritual, this opportunity to draw near to the Lord in a significant and special way. Well, again, what I enjoy about this series is we get immediate application. So we are going to celebrate the Lord's Supper here together. So if you're my ushers and you're going to help, I'd appreciate if you get back and get prepped, but you don't need to come down yet. And so we're going to lower the lights just to help us focus and to think. Now, those of you online, sorry you can't be here with us. We ask you to just spend this time in prayer and contemplation. Likewise, if you're here and not yet a believer in Jesus, we invite you to just pass the elements and not participate at this time. So because of our interest this morning in connecting with ancient tradition, I have here a reading I have adapted from that Didache. All right? So this is our oldest Christian writing outside the New Testament. And this reading I've taken from their prayers and guidance about how that church celebrated the Lord's Supper. So here we're going back 1,900 years and connecting with this ancient Christian community. So I'm going to put some stuff up here, some prayers, some readings, and you read the bold part together as we draw near to the Lord in this way, okay? Now concerning the Eucharist, give thanks as follows. First, concerning the cup. And concerning the broken bread. Just as this broken bread was scattered upon the mountains and then was gathered together and became one. As we distribute the bread, I encourage you to close your eyes. Thank the Lord for his blessings and his gifts to you. Confess your sins to him and joyfully receive his forgiveness. Ushers, please distribute the bread. Let's pray. Father, we bless you and we thank you for the gift of life you've given us just in being here on the earth. And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of life that is ours in Jesus. Thank you for his death on the cross for our sins and his resurrection from the dead. Father, we confess to you we are sinners in word, thought, and deed, both by what we've done and what we've left undone. We ask your forgiveness. We confess to you the sinfulness, Lord. We thank you for the forgiveness that is ours in Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let's continue with these readings again from that ancient church preserved for us in the Didache. So we'll get that on the screen here. There we go. And after you have had enough, give thanks as follows. You, almighty master, created all things for your name's sake and gave food and drink to humans to enjoy so they might give you thanks. But to us, you have graciously given spiritual food and drink and eternal life through your servant. Remember your church, Lord, to deliver it from all evil and to make it perfect in your love. And from the four winds, gather the church that has been sanctified into your kingdom which you have prepared for it, for yours is the power and the glory forever. If 
If anyone is holy, let him come. If anyone is not, let him repent. Okay, so today we cast our eye across all of church history, really, with an eye towards the regular weekly celebration of communion. And we see this is the pattern in the New Testament, continued on in the early church, attempted to be carried on in the Reformation, and yet restored to a true understanding of communion, but things stumbled a little bit, and we got away from this regular practice. But we have an opportunity to return to that in this church. And so hopefully this is something for you to value and to leverage for your spiritual growth. Because remember, the rituals, the habits, the patterns of our lives, they do stuff to us. Uh, They shape us in ways we're not aware of. Well, here's a deliberate pattern. Here's something done deliberately to shape us, to tune our hearts, to aim for the kingdom and for heaven. And by the way, that's why I read the same thing at the end of every sermon. The same benediction is an attempt to have a rhythm or something that over time, as those words, we keep hearing them, hopefully over the weeks, the months, and the years, they shape us and imprint upon us Christ's will for us and not the will of the world. So go out into that world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Repay no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.